So good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. I'd like to introduce my wife, Cindy Martin. Good morning. Um, Mother of two, grandmother of two, um, a very, very active member of the Scleroderma Foundation in the San Diego and in the LA area. Uh, My name is Bill Martin. Uh, I'm also on the national board of the Scleroderma Foundation, and both of us have been very active. Um, We're here today to talk about stem cell transplants. Cindy had a stem cell transplant back in 2012. We shared our story three years ago at the Anaheim Convention in 2014, yeah. and they've asked us back to give an update and to share our story again, so we're very honored to do that. So we'd like to start off by saying that we're not doctors. We have no initials after the end of our names. We, uh, we learned everything the hard way. We started, we studied, we researched. Um, we did what you guys are doing. We came and we listened. We spent the last six years of our life dedicated to this treatment option for scleroderma. Um, we believe it saved Cindy's life, and we believe that there are numerous people in this room where it saved their life as well. So one of the things that, that we want to make sure you understand is this is, um, this is a lot of information that we've put together over the years. It is, um, some of it is our opinion. And some of it is just from from basic facts, too. So we want to make sure that you understand that we're not saying um, anything from a doctor level. We're saying this all from our own personal level. So how do we start off? I will tell you that Cindy was diagnosed in 2010, and we came to the Boston Conference in 2010. We are much like the new persons here today. We had no idea what to expect. So we came here to learn. We were blown away by what we learned. And uh, we were amazed that this foundation has put on such an incredible type of an event where we can learn so much about scleroderma. We uh, came back in 2011, and in San Francisco, they had this this group like this. They, They brought in two scientists or researchers that were doing research on stem cell transplants. One was from the Scott trial, and one was from the ASSIST-2 trial. And both of those uh, presentations were given, and the discussions were had, and afterwards we were so confused because one doctor said, this is a very dangerous treatment, and you probably shouldn't do it, and the other doctor said, it's almost too late, you need to do it now. And as patients and as caregivers, that's really hard to navigate. How do you know what to do when you get so many different um, variations of what treatment options? Of course, we were always afraid that we didn't have the right option, right? Uh, Looking for the right pill, looking for the right right treatment. Um, Should we be on CELSEP? Should we be on Cytoxin? So when when we attended that conference, we were confused. But we were also informed. We learned about this treatment option that could possibly stop the progression of the disease. And... Afterwards, we sat down and we said, if she progresses more, we think we're going to take this option. Well, as it turned out, a few months later after that conference, Cindy was diagnosed with uh, lung disease. And the day she was diagnosed with lung disease, we had already researched enough about this option that we said yes. And And within three days, we had actually talked to the transplant doctor. And we had started that path down that road. So, came back in 2012, Cindy has already been uh, approved for the transplant. She has not had it yet. We came back thinking, oh, by now, we're going to go listen to everybody speak, and there will be a lot of clarity about what we're doing. And sure enough, there was nothing, <laughs> nothing but more confusion, because it, it was still a very, very young um, treatment option, and they were still trying to figure it out. And, and we sat down with a couple of doctors who said, this is still dangerous, and we said, if your wife had scleroderma, would you do this option? And the answer was yes. And that gave us the confidence to move forward. Um, Cindy had her transplant, very successful, that's why she's talking. <laughs> and um, we came back and, um, to Atlanta in 2013, and Cindy was bald, you know, but she was very recognizable. Uh, just like a rock star in 2013. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. He's so sweet. Uh, what was very interesting was that people recognized her. 
Uh, we had started a Facebook group called Scleroderma Stem, so Stem Cell Pioneers, and people started recognizing Cindy from that Facebook group. And so it was sort of interesting. We came back, and, and, and we were very happy. We talked to people at an individual level. In 2014, they asked us to share that story. So 2014, um, a lot of you have seen the video already um, about Cindy and I's story at that time. And it was uh, it's one of the no number one viewed videos from the Scleroderma Foundation. And so we did that in 2014. In 2015, we brought a panel of, of stem cell pioneers that had the stem cell treatment done. And we spoke about it. And in that panel, we had people who had successful transplants. We had people who um, had relapsed. And we had people who were going through it very young. So one of the things that we do believe in is speaking about everything, and from the successes, but also the relapses. So when you, when, you t when you go to the Pioneer page, you will see that we're very straightforward. This disease is, very, is a very hard disease to navigate. And so a truth for us is very, very important. Um, in New Orleans, we had a doctor come speak about this, Dr. Burt from Northwestern Hospital. He came and spoke and gave us some updates um, that were very enlightening, as a matter of fact, about where this is going and what it's doing. And then this year, they've asked us to come back and speak again. So that's why we're here. So what is this treatment? I used to try to pronounce this first word. Hematopoietic. <laughs> Say it again. Hematopoietic. Yeah, stem cell transplant. This is why we are a team. <laughs> so what is this treatment? This treatment is basically the concept is this. If your immune system is attacking you, why don't you just turn off your immune system and reboot it, much like you do a computer. And that's what this is all about. It's basically shutting down your immune system. Um, and then um, that's done with chemo. And then now when I add this to it, it's also done with chemo and radiation. A few years back, we talked about the Scott trial that was stopped, and, and it now is now about ready to be published. And as it turned out, chemo plus radiation is still going to be used today. So we want to talk about that a little bit more uh, down the road. But basically, you're turning off the immune system by using chemo or chemo radiation. Then they, what they do is they take your own stem cells. This is, really isn't a stem cell transplant. If you have a kidney transplant, you don't get your same kidney back, right? No. Um, in a stem cell transplant, you get your same stem cells back. These stem cells are removed from your body. They are frozen and stored until you are ready for the transplant. And that, after they shut down your immune system, they put them back in. They're really used to help reboot your system. They're not used for much more than that. There's no miracle weirdness that goes on with these things. They're just your own stem cells. So that's what happens. Um, this is not a stem cell treatment. Um, you'll see some people out there uh, talking about stem cell treatments. This is not a treatment, OK? They don't treat these stem cells. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of scientific um, dis discussion going on about stem cell treatments for different things for like hand regeneration. There's, a, there's one of our sponsors out here that will talk to you about that. This is not that. We don't use stem cells from umbilical cords. We don't use any of that. These are your own stem cells. And one of the best ways to understand whether or not this is stem cell transplant versus a stem cell treatment, if they're not using chemotherapy, it's not a stem cell transplant, okay? You know, I'm going to keep doing this. This is going to look great on the video. Okay, so testing, what happens? So you make a decision that you want to try to move forward with this, with this treatment. So they test. They do a lot of testing. But one of the most important tests they do is they test the heart. In about 2011, a paper came out published by uh, Northwestern Hospital about the heart. We found out that because scleroderma has what we call stiff heart, that the heart failure rate was causing a lot of mortality, a lot, um, up to 10% mortality in this treatment. This is prior to 2011. So once they started testing the heart, they understood that the heart was the key to surviving this treatment. Um, basically, they, they talk about, when they talk about the heart, they're talking about fluid overload. You have so many fluids that come into your body, your heart has to be able to get rid of that. And um, sometimes the heart can't do that. So now they start testing for the heart. So back in 2012, the way that worked was they tested your heart, and if your heart was, in, was um, at a certain level of dysfunction, you could not get this transplant. 
um, update. As of today, there are two new protocols today that allow those people who have heart conditions to get this transplant. One's called a heart-friendly protocol, and the other one has got a really scientific name, super heart-friendly protocol. <laughs> okay. And basically what it is, is it's the number of days that, that you get cytoxin or treatment, and they limit the number of days and the number of drugs that you get. So far, that is still in a, in, in a uh, it's still in an infancy. We don't know the results of that long term yet. But as of about three months ago, they had done about 22 of these at Northwestern Hospital. And so far, there's been no mortality. So um, pretty Best amazing news. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when you hear they're talking, testing for the heart, that's what we're talking about, OK? So what's the next step? The next step is mobilization. How do we get those stem cells out of your body? So once you've been approved to move forward, what happens is you get, um, you go in for um, some what they call mobilization, it takes about 10 days. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna force the stem cells that are in your bone marrow out into your bloodstream. And they're basically just going to collect them. So this is how that works. And um, yes, they go through the neck, <laughs> they get them. Um, but basically what it is, you're harvesting, you're gathering. You need about 2 million stem cells. And there we go. There's a couple more pictures of what this, the procedure is about. The stem cells there are on the right there. Oops, you, you can't see the stem cells yet. Okay. So um, they gather your, your stem cells, they retrieve them, they freeze them. Okay. And then you go away for about 10 days. Then you come back. And then you go get chemotherapy uh, or chemotherapy and radiation. This takes uh, about 17 days in the hospital. The, um, the standard protocols are about four to five days of chemotherapy uh, over a six-day period. And some of the other protocols are a much shorter period. But basically, you're going to be in, the, in the, the chemotherapy range for about six days. Then... You wait till about day, we call it day zero. What happens at day zero is that your, your chemotherapy is done, your immune system has been completely shut off, and now you're going to get your stem cells back. And on the right there, you can see that the, uh, the stem cells are in that bag there. You need about 2 million stem cells, okay? And those are all coming from your body. And they infuse them, it takes about 10 minutes. We call this day zero. This is your new birthday. Then you wait. And you wait, and you wait. And it's a very long time. It feels like months and months and months, but it's about 10 days. And during that time period, your immune system is rebooting. It's restarting. It's starting to, to uh, uh, make new white blood cells, red blood cells, immune cells. And about 10 plus, 10 plus days from that day, what happens is your body goes through kind of a miracle. You go from absolutely feeling like, like a Mack truck hits you to feeling really, really well. And what's happening is your, is your body's coming alive again. Um, we, we often say it's like going to hell and making a U-turn, right? Mm -hmm. And you're becoming alive, and then within a couple of days, you get to leave the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you go from not being able to do much to being able to walk and get out, okay? And that's, that's the miracle of this thing. It's amazing to watch somebody go through this. Um, the gentleman on the wheelchair in the middle there is the patient that was next door to Cindy. His name is Arian, uh, a friend for life here. And of course, you might recognize some of the other ones in there too. Okay. So, in 2014, when we gave this talk, there was only one place in the United States that was doing the treatment and the clinical trial, and that was the uh, Northwestern Hospital, Dr. Burt. Since then, they started the STAT trial. But these are the trials that have existed um, for, for the period of time for scleroderma. The, orig the original one was the ASSIS trial. It was over in Europe. It showed an awful lot of incredible information about, and they, they tested everybody. They tested people that were, were at the very far end and, and, and really bad, the smokers, they tested everybody. And we received a lot of information from that. The Scott trial was done, and it is publishing. They did the abstract already. It's got some amazing results, and you'll see the final publishing here in the next couple of weeks in the Scott trial. That Scott trial was done with radiation and chemo. Um, the, assist two, uh, the ASSIST-1 trial was published. That had 19 patients in it. 
The STAT trial is ongoing right now, still recruiting at this point. The ASSIST 2 trial is still ongoing and uh, recruiting. The STAT trial is a multi-center trial, and that's, I think there's about eight different centers that they are, they're doing this at, Chicago, I mean, Seattle, and so forth. Uh, the ASSIST 2 trial is only being done at Northwestern Hospital. And then in, in, uh, in Europe, they have the AS MoMA trial, which is being done in Germany. Now, 2014, you didn't have much of an option. I will tell you today, you have multiple options. Not only do you have these clinical trials, but there are now becoming standard of care treatments at a lot of different um, scleroderma centers. For instance, University of Michigan does, does about eight to 10 of these a year now. So you don't have to be in a trial to get this done. You just have to know where to go. MD Anderson, Houston as MD well. MD Anderson, Anderson's doing it. There's multiple centers. Center, um, you just need to ask them if they're doing it or not. But you don't longer have to be in a clinical trial to get this done. So one of the, the slides we're going to be adding right now is um, patients around the world with scleroderma. And I will tell you that, I don't know if this is showing up well or not. Oh, there we go. It's showing up good. So this is a worldwide discussion we're having, not just a, a U.S. discussion. It's not a single hospital discussion. It is multiple locations throughout the world, Canada, Europe, Australia, uh, Brazil, and so forth. In the U.S., we asked a bunch of patients to say, if you had a stem cell transplant, just tell us where you, where you, where you live. And we, got to, we, got to, we have a huge population out there. And this is just a simple sample of what we took from a couple of weeks ago. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. So a little bit into our story now. Those are the facts, okay? Those are, that's, the, that's what kind of what happens, okay? So our story started in 2009 where we were, um, our children had grown. They had left the nest. We were empty nesters. Um, Cindy and I were marathoners. I was a coach. She was running marathons. We were doing a lot of work for charity work for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, we thought, okay, the kids are gone. Let's go play. And uh, we started traveling all throughout the world. Um, this is Papua New Guinea in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> we look back now, we think this is where she got scleroderma. Yeah, you think those natives, maybe they have poison darts. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, prove that we didn't there. Okay. <laughs> this is Cindy Martin. Thank you. Thanks. You do, you do a good job. So he told you the basics of how it works, and now I want to tell you a little bit more about the personal side of the story. Um, but I do want you to be aware that this is just one story, and I think that map and the people in this room and the photos will show you that there are a lot of people with this experience now. And as much as scleroderma manifests differently in each of us, we each experience transplant differently. So I know my story is not the only one, but I hope it inspires you to maybe learn a little bit more and um, give it a consideration for yourself and other people you know with aggressive disease. So my, um, my diagnosis started probably like many of you. First of all, it just seemed like a lot of ordinary things that happened to us in life, but there was too many of them all at once. I had heartburn. Oh, I had those running injuries, and he was the coach, and I'd say, it hurts right here, and he goes, it can't hurt right there. That's not where the running injuries are because it wasn't a running injury. Um, GERD, I thought every time I ran more than eight miles, I would bleed. And I thought, what the heck? I gotta stop running this distance? What's going on? Um, what else was going on? The swelling was crazy. Did you have crazy swelling? The hands, the feet, the legs swelling like mad. Pitting edema is disgusting. Yeah. What is that when you push it in and it won't bounce out? So I kept bugging my family doctor. I said, Derek, something's going wrong. Something's going wrong. And he goes, oh, be, be patient. You're, you know, it'll clear up. You don't have any blood clots, so you're okay. Go home. Put my legs up the wall. <laughs> try everything. Low sodium diet. Try everything. Well, finally, finally, he, he referred me to a surgeon for the carpal tunnel. And I went to this gentleman, and he said, you know, Cindy, the carpal tunnel is not causing the swelling. The swelling is causing the carpal tunnel. That was a good light bulb moment. That means chase down the swelling a lot harder. And so I started asking Derek, is it kidneys? Could it be kidneys? What else can we look at? And it took him quite a while longer, but he finally sent me to a rheumatologist. You know how that goes. As soon as you walk in the door, she knows what it is. <laughs> 
She knows exactly what it is. But still, she ran 23 blood tests. She did not tell me what it was. She did x-rays of my hands in case of with arthritis. And what do you do while you're waiting between the blood test and your next appointment to get the results? You look up the purpose of every one of those blood tests. <laughs> you Google, dangerous as it is. Um, so I had figured it out. And I went back to the appointment with Bill, and I said to her, I said, I think I know what I have. And she goes, what? I said, scleroderma. She said, yes. And I go, diffuse systemic. She goes, no, don't get confused with all the crazy words. Let's, let's go slow. Um, she just wanted to call it crest, and she wanted to call it limited. But everything I read, I felt it was definitely diffuse already. Um, so at that point, I got tears in my eyes, and I thought, oh, this is not good. But very quickly, I sucked the tears in, and I said, hey, I got a diagnosis. Now we can start treatment, and we can get that cured. Joke's on me. There is no cure. That sucks. Now what do we do? We're going to take action. <sighs> Let me catch up with myself. OK, so uh, as things progressed for me, I ended up with my GI doctor. I told you there was bleeding. There was, I had watermelon stomach already at that point. He scoped it. And I had heartburn, very bad GERD, right? Um, and that one of the days I saw him, he had a resident in the hospital. And he goes, do you mind if I bring the resident in to check you out? I said, yes, let's teach everybody as we can so we can get diagnosis going a little bit faster. And that young man came in, and he felt my arms and my hands and my cheeks. And he goes, my goodness, how many years have you had this? Three months. Three months from my diagnosis. And he thought I'd had it for years. What I'm trying to tell you, what my GI doctor told me that day, is that I had a very aggressive, rapidly progressing case. Then I went um, to UCLA. UCLA is the closest scleroderma specialty clinic to us. And I saw the fantastic Dr. Kana. He is now at the head of University of Michigan, but at the time he was at UCLA. And I had my appointment with him, and he gave me my skin score. So my first skin score was a 30. As high, fast. That was my first summer. I think it was July when we saw him. I had just been diagnosed in April. So um, that was interesting. If you're not familiar with the Robin skin score, zero is normal skin, and 51 is the hardness everywhere. So 30 is pretty high. Um, lungs. I had a pulmonologist, I had a doctor team at home in San Diego with my HMO. And they don't do very much scleroderma, they do a little bit, and, but they were very generous with testing. So my pulmonologist did all the appropriate tests, and he had this great image of my lungs, my chest CT, and he sent a copy with me to UCLA. But rather than send the full-blown beautiful color, we got a static black and white image. So I take this to UCLA, and Dr. Kana looks at it, he goes, darn it, it's so small, I can't really tell what's going on here. And then Dr. First walked in, because they share that clinic, and so the wise and wonderful Dr. First says, oh, yep, lung fibrosis, ground glass. OK, got to go, deal with that. <laughs> and he left real quick. And then Dr. Kana and I talked about it. He goes, I'm not sure. Dr. Kana sees it for sure. I think maybe, but I really can't be honest without this image. I go back to San Diego and tell my pulmonologist the results of that meeting, and he's got the image this big and its color, and he can turn it and flip it and spin it, and he, it's 3D. It's amazing. I'm like, why couldn't you send that to UCLA? But he said, I don't see it. I see no fibrosis when I'm looking at it this big. I think they made a mistake. I'm like, those guys don't make mistakes. So with a very big doubt, what could I do? I waited. So it took two more years until I got my diagnosis. But finally it showed up, and in Kaiser they could finally see fibrosis ground glass, and then when they listened, they could hear the crackles, the rails in my lungs. So I was diagnosed with interstitial lung disease in May of 2012. And that day, my health became an emergency. I know that my life expectancy crashed that day. And I love, I love that Dr. Fisher yesterday morning in grand lecture, he said to us, I don't put any statistics on the board because they're never true. They'll upset you, and they're not even true. We tell people, go get your fares in order, and then they live another 30 years. So statistics are no good. But in 2012, people were giving me statistics. So they said, if you have scleroderma, if you have interstitial lung disease, and if your DLCO is less than 60%, your life expectancy is less than a 30% chance to survive five years. My DLCO was down to 52%. You can go to the next page. Um, so that was very scary stuff. 
Luckily for me, oh, uh, the thing I do need to mention is all during this time of my rapid progression, I was on methotrexate. It did nothing to slow it down. So I started out in the very beginning with D-penicillamin, which was an old drug that they ruled out in the 90s. My HMO was not up to speed. But that first visit with Dr. Khanna, he said, don't put another one of those pills in your mouth. Get started on methotrexate. And I crashed and burned while taking methotrexate. Um, so I, I called my good friend Holly, and I said, Holly, I know you had that stem cell transplant thing a couple years ago. Can we talk? And so we met at lunch, and she brought all the medical literature. And Holly, if you don't know her, she is fantastic. It's such a blessing that I got to meet her. She is a family practitioner doctor. She's a scleroderma patient. And she had stem cell transplant two years before me at Northwestern. So I had the perfect mentor. She read the articles with me. She translated the medical ease for me. And we looked at the charts. Like, this isn't the only thing to do, right? So maybe I just should do IV cytoxin. And she said, no, but look, after a year or two, it's as if you did nothing. So you get better for that year or two, but then you're equal to your peers. So I'm like, well, I don't want to waste time with that. And that's when Holly taught me one of the best expressions. You need to be as aggressive as your disease. I need to get tough. OK, we'll get tough. So this is how I made my decision for stem cell transplant. My DSL failed rapidly. I had no idea if it would stop, if I would taper off or not. We have no crystal ball. And so the debate is, not only do the doctors ask, are you sick enough but not too sick? I have to play a guessing game. Am I going to get worse or am I going to stay here? My dad always says, insurance is like a gamble. Are you voting for yourself or against yourself? And I felt that way again, trying to guess about my crystal ball. Um, but I know that there was a very poor prognosis, whatever those numbers were. One of the doctors even said, with, with ILD that low, that maybe it was only a 50-50 chance of surviving. And I want to apologize. If I'm saying these words and these terrible statistics, and this is the first time you're hearing it, I'm sorry to be the one to say it. Um, it's very scary to hear. I hated the people who said it my first year, very cavalier. Um, so I apologize, and I hope you hear the rest of the story, which is the statistics change. And my attitude at the time, while they were standing by those statistics in their articles, my thought at the time was, well, I'm one person. I'm not the whole bell curve. So if I'm aggressive and I take action, I'm going to look at all the clinical trials. I'm going to find second and third and fourth opinions. I'm going to go out and read blogs and talk to other patients. That means I'm going to change my statistic. So I encourage you to change your statistic, not necessarily copy me, but find out what works for your unique case with the best doctors you can find. So now I've decided for, scler uh, I've decided for stem cell transplant. Now I have to pick my location. Dr. Khanna and Dr. First were not encouraging about doing Scott trial, the one with radiation. So I turned away from that. If they're not encouraged by it, I'm not encouraged by it. Um, and then I went to Dr. Burt. Ah, did I skip the fact that I got to meet him so quickly? So on a Wednesday, I got diagnosed with interstitial lung disease. That Saturday, Dr. Burt was in my hometown speaking at our education day. What a lucky break. So I heard him speak about his theories about stem cell transplant sooner rather than later, because the promise is to stop progression. So we want to stop it before I have too much permanent damage. It's not promised to make me better and whole and healthy again, just to stop. And I thought, well, I could, I could live at this state for a long time. If I don't get any worse, I'll be here for graduations and weddings and babies. Um, I told you I'd read some blogs. So Victoria Chavez and Ken Athens were the two I read their blogs. Their blog link is on that handout with all the other patients. And that wasn't enough for me, so I called them and emailed them and pestered them with all my questions. And I made a list of pros and cons. So the pros. My disease had a 70% chance of being halted, and that would increase my life expectancy. The icing on the cake is I had heard people who had had their lungs improved. I didn't fully understand it at the time, but now I know some of our lung disease is a problem because of inflammation, and some of it is because of scar tissue, which is called fibrosis. The fibrosis is permanent. That can't be reversed. But to the extent your lungs have inflammation, that can be knocked out. And I knew that other people were feeling really, really good. So Ken Athens, his profile was very similar to mine as far as um, his, all his lab tests. And he was also a scuba diver and a runner and a golfer. And scleroderma took all those away. And he got them all back after transplant. He ran his first full marathon less than one year after his transplant. So I went to Dr. Burton and said, give me the Ken Athens plan. <laughs> but the cons. I like to be real. 
I don't want to be a cheerleader telling you only the good stuff. The pros, I mean, the, the cons are there, and you have to be ready to face them if this is what you are going to choose. It could be a life-ending procedure. I knew this. I knew I could die. At, in 2012, when I made my decision, they had just the Assist One publication out. That was only 19 patients, and they hadn't fully figured out the heart stuff. So at that point, it was about a 5.5% mortality for those, that group of 19 people. The mitigating fact to me was by the time I came along, he knew about the heart problem, so he was screening those people out. So if you had heart problems, he was going to deny you. So, okay, if he approves me, that means I can go forward. Um, but it could fail to succeed. So 30% of people relapse. That's really hard, but what other choice do we have? We need to try it. And the people I knew at the time who had relapsed said, I'd still do it again. My life quality is still better than it had been. Um, sadly, my dearest friend, who I've now named multiple times, Victoria Chavez, she relapsed at the four-year point. Her lungs became terrible. She was on a waiting list for a double lung transplant, and they decided she was too ill to accept those lungs, and Victoria died. So it happens, and I'll be real, um, but she's a pioneer. She made a big difference. She paved the way for us. Um, forever grateful to her, and I, I always tell her family that every time I think of it. Um, another Hollyism. Holly says, this is not an elegant treatment, but it's the best thing we have to stop progression of the disease. We have some drugs that may slow it down. We have some drugs that may um, simplify some of our, our symptoms, but this is the only thing trying, promising, to halt the disease. So that's what we're going to do. Oh, the money. I don't want to talk about money. That's the hard part. So this is not a funded trial. A lot of drug companies fund trial, and you can go participate for free. We need to pay for this. The government doesn't pay for this. But the good news is most insurance does pay for it. Even Medicare has paid for it for a long time. And those of you who are already in our Facebook group have heard in the last few months that Medicare was no longer being accepted at Northwestern. Well, that's because the FDA, was it, no, Medicare themselves, Medicare themselves occasionally has to do an audit and a review. They usually just trust the paperwork that comes, and then occasionally they go spot check. So Northwestern got that spot check. They came out clean, and Dr. Burt told me on Friday they're ready to start accepting Medicare again. So thank God. Thank God. So the cost. The cost um, is typically about $125,000 to $150,000 to do a stem cell transplant. And I've confirmed this both at Northwestern and some of the other doctors in the STAT trial. Um, in addition, your evaluation testing will run about twenty-five dollars to $30,000, unless you have complications. So again, in the Facebook group, you may have recently seen someone post, she was quoted a cost of $300,000. Dr. Burt confirmed for me she was a very complex case with a lot of complications and difficulties during her process. So that is why, but the price is still around 125 to 150,000. In my case, I only ended up paying 2,500, which was my copay, and they covered some of our travel. Okay, how is it done? Am I running very slow? <laughs> uh, I requested an outside referral. I got it. My rheumatologist said, go get tested. I'll submit your referral to the HMO. Who knows if it'll get covered or not, but go get tested. I got tested. Um, they accepted me. I came home. Dr. Burt says, go do your 50th birthday party with your family, and we'll do transplant after that. So I had this last big celebration. It was hard to do because my heart was broken in case I never see them again. I uh, didn't tell them that. <laughs> they just thought I was a little bit stressed. And I came home from that birthday trip thinking everything's in order, and I got the message that no, insurance had stuck my referral in a committee of cancer doctors for about 100 days. No response. So then you have to fight. Some people get denials, and then they can start doing the appeal process. In fact, many people get denied with the insurance and have to appeal multiple times. In our Facebook group, we have a few people with a lot of experience, some that have worked with attorneys, and we have letters, and we help people with their appeals. So I had to fight, and I called um, patient services. I got a case manager. I had a, a friend who's an attorney who called an attorney that worked at Kaiser in the public relations department. That still wasn't enough. It was a Kaiser case manager supervisor who told me, you need to file a complaint against us at the State Board of Managed Health Care. I did that, pushed the button online. Less than 24 hours later, I got my approval. <laughs> and that was the Friday night before we flew out. 
So I'd gone to the bank to transfer money out of retirement money to make a cashier's check Saturday morning so we could fly Sunday to have treatment start on Monday. It barely came together. Okay. Um, I didn't, I, I flew through the evaluation testing. I just want to talk about right heart cath. Everyone's afraid of the right heart cath and they ask if it's painful. I say, no, it's not painful. It's just awkward as heck. They, they put a blanket over your head and just this little piece is sticking out and they put a catheter in. So it's a prick like a needle. And then I have crispy bits right here. So they had a little hard time getting it. They need to get it in your heart. And so that was fine though, that was no problem. And then they pushed fluids to test how you tolerate the fluid. And that's how they found out I have a stiff heart. And they said, oh, she's not tolerating. Can we continue? Should we stop? Do we push more fluid or do we have to stop? So it wasn't painful, but I freaked out with an anxiety attack right there. And what I've said in the past is I felt naked on an iceberg. I was just shivering with fear that I'm not going to pass. I can't get this. But Dr. Birch said, despite having a, a stiff heart, he would move forward if I was willing, but that I had to understand I was a higher risk. And I said, what other choice do I have? Of course I'm moving forward. Okay, moving forward. We moved to Chicago. Um, I say it's about two months. It ended up being 45 days. We were so blessed. Again, so many things lined up for us. Somebody's hand, and I think it was God, lined everything up for us. Our good friend Mike from San Diego, the marathon team, moved to Chicago for a job. He bought a three-bedroom apartment overlooking Millennium Park. It's one mile from the hospital. He had two empty bedrooms for when his sons came to visit, and he said, one's your office, one's your bedroom, move in. Perfect. Perfect. Um, you go in for one night of mobilization chemo. So you get chemo. Got it. You get one night of chemo and um, they test you how your heart's doing. Then you get, you have to do your belly shots. That was no fun. But I would do those shots in the morning as difficult as they were. And then we would go to the sweet little bakery and eat treats. Uh, there was some bone pain, but mostly Tylenol was enough. They give you narcotics, and I think I used it a couple of times, but like I said, mostly Tylenol was enough for me. Then you go back to the harvest. Uh, this is the harvest day, back in that neck, and um, it was actually pretty comfortable. I had my iPad, I got a turkey sandwich for lunch, and I got everything I needed in one day. Get a two-week rest period. I took my bachelor friend Mike shopping to decorate the bachelor pad, and I would only um, be good for about four hours, then I'd have to nap. But then I could get up and we could go to a restaurant or I could cook dinner. Then we check into the hospital. The day before you admit, you get a pick line put in. If you've ever had a port, I think it's similar. It's a lot of work to get that sucker in there, but then you avoid a lot of needle sticks after that. Uh, I had five days of chemo, day minus five, minus four, minus three. And during this time, you also have to have a Foley, a Foley catheter. Because phytoxin creates a risk of bladder cancer, the Foley catheter is going to irrigate your bladder. It's shooting water up in there, and then another bag catches it coming out. So for five days, there were no panties. I had my IV pole with my in bag and my out bag, and I would walk laps. And then finally, when that thing came out, I was telling nurses, I got panties today. Yay! <laughs> It's the little things. It's the little things. Um, and then day zero, a really, really special day. You're going to get your stem cells back. The medical team usually poses for pictures. I chose to have the hospital pastor bless my cells. That was very sweet. And the morning was happy because that was great. But then I crashed. And I was down for three days. I was awake some of that time, but still wanting my eyes closed. I cannot describe to you how much fatigue there was except to say, Walking from the bed to the bathroom felt like a marathon. It was hard work. I didn't want any showers, but you have no immune system, so the showers are important. So a helper is super important, even though he has to see his wife look like Uncle Fester, bald and in a tented gown, and I had gained 17 pounds of fluid, and it wasn't me, and you lose uh, some dignity, but you get through it. Um, so those three days were rough. My watermelon stomach started to bleed, uh, the nurse did not want to disturb the doctor in the night, and I do not recommend that. The doctor says, here's my pager number. Anything comes up, you let me know. I wish we'd let him know because I just had blood in my stool all night waiting till they came back around on rounds at 10 a.m. And it was a quick little drink of something that looked a lot like pecto uh, I ended up having eight blood transfusions and 11 platelet transfusions. It's not uncommon. Your body is trying to piece it back together. Um, I told you I didn't open my eyes much. 
At the end of those three days, when I was ready to open my eyes, it was because I heard music. And to me, it sounded like a harp. And seriously, I asked myself if I was dead and if I was in heaven. This is harp music, right? But wait a minute, what else could it be? Wait, it might be something else. Wait, it's a flute. It was a flute. I thought, okay, we can't have flowers and plants delivered to our room. Maybe someone sent a musician to play for me. That would be a really cool idea. <laughs> but it was a music student. They come around to the hospital and play for the patients in the hall, and it echoed beautifully. And so I finally stood up from bed and went to the door and just cried. The tears just flowed and flowed, and it was beautiful. And, and Bill had just come back from a run, and I'm standing there bawling. <laughs> This would be a, probably a good time for us to talk a little bit about caregiving. And real quick, the caregivers that are a really important part of this, um, let me just say the first thing you need to do is take care of yourself. Um, my routine was I get up in the morning um, from the hotel or the, the apartment and I would walk, eat, and pray on the way to the hospital. And then I would spend all my time in the hospital with her. But then during the day I would go out for an hour, hour and a half run. Um, just to be by myself and kind of get myself centered again. And then every night I would walk back about a mile and a half and do the exact same thing. I would eat, I would pray and listen to music. And the reason I say that is you need to remember you need to eat every day. You need to take care of yourself every day. We see a lot of caregivers break down uh, during this process because it is so long and so hard on you because you don't do anything besides watch. And your job as a caregiver is to pay attention and you need to take care of yourself in order to pay attention. Amen. Amen. The caregivers are so critical, make a big difference, big difference. Um, home recovery, there's two critical measurements. Uh, you watch your first 100 days and you watch your first year. So that first 100 days you have almost no immune system. It's teeny, teeny, teeny. It's there, but it's not much. And while those stem cells are trying to become an immune system, you're pretty weak. So you're very, very clean. You take anti virals, antifungals, antibacterial drugs. You wash your hands and wash your hands and wash your hands. Everyone who comes into your house, take off your shoes, wash your hands, don't stay long. You can go, I went to church and I went to uh, the cafe at, at, for breakfast, but Bill carried a lot of Clorox wipes and touched every, everything that I would touch, he would wipe down that 100 days. It requires a lot of patience. It takes a year to get your full strength back. It took me 18 months to lose that foggy brain, whether it was sclerofog or chemofog, I don't know, it's one fog. Um, it takes a lot of patience. It's two steps forward and one step back. I would say every patient I've spoken to about this feels sometime during that year we thought we had relapsed. It's because it's such a long, slow, difficult process. But you hang in there. Uh, we started walking in the hospital a little bit, but we also walked at home. My marathon coach would not let me sit still. His belief is movement, eh, use it or lose it, keep going, keep going. Um, but in the beginning when I got home, I couldn't walk right outside my house. We live on a little slope. So we drove, we drove the car like four houses away to where it was flat <laughs> so I could walk past two houses and get back in the car. And slowly we built up. And finally I said to the doctor, can I walk at the park? Because dirt, bacteria, it's bad news. They give you a long list of things you can't do that first bit of time. He says, go ahead, go to the park, but not the dirt yet. And finally, go to the dirt. And so we're walking and walking. And finally, I said, wow, this is weird. I feel like running. Where did that come from? And so we started doing these little runs. I was at 30 seconds and a one minute walk. 30 second run, one minute walk. Then one minute run, one minute walk. Two minute run, one minute walk. And uh, it was pretty awesome. Um, Day 100, I did something really crazy. I ran a race. And uh, Bill was awesome. He bought me the VIP package. I still had Raynaud's. It was still bothersome. So they gave us a ride up to the start line so we didn't have to stand out in that cold. And this um, lovely young woman from a local college came out and interviewed me. And I sure felt like I was on national TV. I was celebrating. I was so happy to be running again. And I did intervals. I didn't run beginning to end. I, d I believe it was a one minute run, two minute walk that I did the whole 5K. And I sent Dr. Burt the medal because it was his accomplishment in my eyes. Okay, let's look at my final test results. Oh, oh, here's Grand Canyon. Yes, a year and a half after transplant, my Bible study group said, we're going to hike Grand Canyon, and you are too. I said, are you kidding me? I, I got a hotel reserved at the top of the mountain, and I did the training, trying to be optimistic, and two weeks before the hike, I canceled the hotel. Okay, I can do this, and I did. It was awesome. 
Um, this was, we've been backpacking. It went so well, we went backpacking from M Mammoth to Yosemite, and we found my limit. 11,056 feet was a little too high. I'm not going any higher. <laughs> okay, here's my test results. So, skin score dropped. One year after transplant, I went from a 35 to a 9, and then a year later, or a few years later, I'm all the way down to a 3. Not zero, but you might as well be zero. My, my lung function, the middle categories, you know, the FBC, TLC, they're way over 80%, so that's in the normal range. My DLCO, remember I told you some of it can be due to inflammation and some of it due to fibrosis, so the inflammation part got better very quickly, but the fibrosis is pretty much permanent. But I'm very happy with 74, 75%, and I'm stable, and I'm, I, all the things I can do. Um, so what's happening that's negative, uh, stem cell transplant, the chemo put me into menopause right away. So I've dealt with hot flashes and all that fun stuff. Um, it was going to happen anyway. <laughs> um, I still have GERD. I used to take three omeprazole a day. I only take two omeprazole a day, and that's the only medication I'm on. I still have Raynaud's, uh, but not nearly as bad. In the beginning, the first couple years, I would say it was definitely just as bad. So last time I reported, I said GERD, um, digestive issues, and Raynaud's hadn't changed at all. I would say now that I'm four and a half years post-transplant, it has changed. Um, so would I do it again? Without a doubt. There are many, many days that I forget that I have scleroderma. I feel really happy to be able to do everything I want with the grandbabies. And, um, this might sound terrible. I, I don't mean it to sound terrible. My mom has cancer. But I am able to be the caregiver. I'm taking care of her. And there's no interrupting her day with my stuff. So yes, I would absolutely do it again. OK, you may wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. OK, here's a fun picture. <laughs> This is from one of our pioneers one year out. So. Maya's here. Wave, Maya. Maya. Raise your hand. There you go. So this, this picture says it all. Uh, I know we're about running out of time. We'd like to get some questions and answers, but we have some important things to talk about. I want you to think about scleroderma as having a baseball bat beating the crap out of you every single day. And every single day you receive damage from scleroderma. So the question is, when do you take the baseball bat out of the hands of scleroderma? And if you have aggressive scleroderma, then you're getting more damage than most people. Oh, I did it again. There we go. Okay. So is this a cure? No, it's not. This is primarily to stop the progression of the disease. It is not to get better skin. It's not to get better heart, get a better lung. It is to stop the progression of the disease. It's to take the baseball bat out of the hands of the disease. 70% of the people who have this treatment show no signs of active disease, period. There are people in this room that have had this stem cell transplant 10, 11, 12 years ago that have no active disease. They still have the damage. And the damage that gets repaired is great but you still live with the damage. So the question is, at what point in time do you say, I'm done with the damage, I need to do something about it, okay? And that's what this treatment option is about. There's also a 30% relapse rate. That means that 30% of these people who go through this treatment will go back to having scleroderma. And that also means that we lose pioneers. We lose pioneers in the treatment, and we can lose pioneers who do this treatment down the road. Some of you know this young lady, one of my favorite people. She had the transplant done. It improved the quality of her life, and she lived about another five or six years. So this is a very serious treatment, but it's one of those treatments that you can need to consider as an option. You'll never see Cindy and I say to you, you have to do this. What we say to you, you need to have an option. So it does not improve GERD. It does not improve stomach issues and digestive issues. It does not help with hand curling. That's all the damage that's being done with that baseball bat. Okay, all these things that are being done is being done because you have scleroderma. This stops the progression of the disease. If it does that, then it is, um, it has done its job. So should it be an option for me? Three years ago, 
um, they decided to start, started talking about this being the one of the best options for scleroderma, aggressive scleroderma with lung disease. Now it's considered one of the number one options for aggressive scleroderma with lung disease. Some of the things that are important to remember, if you are a male, if you're African American, if you have aggressive scleroderma in the first six years and you have a lung involvement, look at this option very seriously. This is one of those options that you need to look at today. The treatment is best sooner than later. Take the baseball bat out of the hands of scleroderma. So there are some contact information I'll show you up here. A um, lot of information on the STAT trial. Check your local scleroderma center to see if they are if they're doing this treatment. You don't have to be in a clinical trial anymore, but you can be. There's also a, one last plug for the scleroderma stem cell pioneer group. This is a group of patients who talk about this on a daily basis. Um, we started this group a couple years ago, uh, actually two months after Cindy got out of the hospital. We have over 1,600 members. We talk about this every day with patients. And lastly, thank you for being here. And I don't know if we have any time for questions. 1040 exactly. Okay, questions. Yeah, so first of all, if you, if you have had a stem cell transplant or being part, part of the pioneers, please stand up. Thank you. Um, I, I want to I say this from the bottom of my heart. These guys are heroes. These guys have gone through something to save our lives out here. Okay, they they put their life on the line to do a treatment to save their life. But in turn, we learned so much that now we can help save others. So those are our heroes. Questions. I will start here in the work in the back. I saw you back there, though. I have a mother that's 22. She was diagnosed when she was 15, and she does not have an aggressive form of the disease. As far as she's patient or doctor first, um, but she already has had some, you know, issues, and she's had some damage. My concern is, it, you know, I mean, I would love for her to have it, and it looks like she wants to have it. What is the likelihood of insurance approving it unless the doctor's on board? I can answer that. So what you'll do is get the medical evaluation whether she's qualified and accepted by a doctor to do the transplant. And if he does that, then he will say it's medically necessary. And that's the language you need for the insurance. And would uh, my doctor first be a person, or do I go to Chicago to have her? It's up to you to choose your location. Um, you can do your homework. You can come to the Facebook page and get a lot of opinions. There are people in this room who've had it in multiple locations. There's pros and cons for each. and. Um, I would say my main advice to you is go to the best location you can, not the closest one, because once insurance approves the medical treatment, they also cover a lot of your travel. But now, does your doctor have to be on board with no one? No. No. Your doctor would become the transplant doctor, and they're the ones who then are making the referral to the um, insurance in most cases. But so many different kinds of insurance, it does vary. You get a question back here. Oh, you had said that if you're a man or if you're African American, you should especially consider this. And I didn't know if that meant because the disease is more aggressive with them or because they respond better to treatment. I didn't know why you said it's be that. It's because with men, African Americans, this disease is much more rapid. Mm -hmm. Okay, more, much more aggressive. I think the girl next to Kat and then Kat. I don't believe, really, like, I don't have, at, at this point, at least, I don't have a lot of involvement. I'm still active. I don't have a lot of, it, all things considered, a little number of people. How do you, like, how, how do you make that decision like that? How do you make the decision at what point to go? For me, I felt like, I, I made the decision when I felt like my life was in danger. Um, we had done our homework ahead of time, so we had it in our back pocket, I say. Um, it's a personal choice. Uh, you can use your doctors or you can just use your family and your gut. It's, you've seen, we've told you the bad, the good. 
it's not to be taken lightly. So a lot of people who are stable would not choose this. A lot of doctors would say, don't do it if you're stable or, or have minor involvement. But if you feel in your heart that it's what you want, get more education, read the medical literature, and pursue it. I'm, I'm going to Kat next. Oh, I was just going to say, I had a transplant four years ago. I relapsed at 16 months. I was a lot like Kelly and Joey. We have similar stories. Um, I encouraged everyone to get it, even though I fully relapsed. I'm completely back to being um, with scleroderma, and I just actually got approved to have a donor transplant. I'm sorry, it's like new, a new avenue to try out for us, but just want to tell you that that's how much I believe in it, is it failed for me, and it was an awful experience and everything, but I would do it over again in a heartbeat. And so if anyone in here is feeling nervous or whatever, I just hope that brings some sort of help to you. Well, her lungs improved a lot mm -hmm. doing that and have stabilized at like 72 or something. Right now, 63. Yeah, so they improved a lot. So mm -hmm. we had enough, we had another year and a half. That was very funny. We have one more question. We have one question over here. Oh, I was asking, um, so you have to go there for the mobilization and then come back home and go back? It varies. She's asking, do you have to do mobilization hospital, then go home, and then go back again? It, it varies. So for me, I had the apartment to stay in. I didn't have kids or animals I had to rush back to. So I stayed in Chicago for a two-week rest. I have friends who went home for the holidays and came back two months later between the, the mobilization. So it varies depending on your situation, your doctor. So we want to say thank you guys for allowing us to speak today. Yeah. And we'll stick around for questions. We'll, we'll stick around out in the hall. Thank you.